Thanks, Donna. I'd also like to uh, first thank uh, City and the FDA for a fabulous program and that um, uh, in particular the, the many stories from so many different patients that were both inspired and uh, painful at times to hear. Um, well, getting to uh, play the, the futurist for this panel, I have to add a, a, a disclaimer that these will be my opinions and not necessarily those of my employer or other affiliations, but um, you can hold me accountable in a few years if this is still online and tell me that I was right or wrong. Um, I'm going to share six thoughts on what I think the future holds as we're thinking about patient en engagement in this space. Um, first, there will be consistency in terms of how we are engaging with patients as, uh, as, a, as a voice and as a partner in how studies are being designed. We heard some great stories from a number of different research sponsors and pharmaceutical companies, but it's still too anecdotal. It's not consistent across portfolios yet, and it has to be. Um, and there are barriers we can talk about for why that may be the case. Uh, I really want to call out um, a word that Joe Kim from Lilly had mentioned earlier of empathy, because design thinking is still working its way into the research sponsor's vocabulary, and empathy is a word that still hasn't gotten there. Um, so we have to keep driving that point home. I think everyone thinks they're empathetic, and, and I'm not going to be the person telling people they're not, but that's different from incorporating empathy into how you're uh, designing and engaging. I think the second is, to me is around information needs of patients. And so the second area is I'm thinking about the, the look forward is where research sponsors will consistently understand and meet the information needs of patients across three different persona, the patient before uh, being in a trial, the patient who's in a trial, and the patient when their trial completes. And I'm going to up that because I talk a lot about understanding it and meeting those needs, but I liked how... Um, I liked how Carly uh, mentioned, don't go for the low fruit, go for the high. So let's say understand and in, in beating the information needs of patients across those. The third area as I look forward is, um, is around strategies that can better engage research in the patient's healthcare setting and bridging this divide between research and healthcare. Some people think about it as enabling clinical research as a more consistent care option. Uh, Alicia on Twitter called out the serendipity that's required for a patient to be engaged with a physician who happens to be the investigator in that trial, and that's the serendipity that's required for a patient to actually wind up even learning about a study. We have to find strategies that can enable patients treating physicians so that this can be a story of shared decision making in the future rather than the serendipity that's required today or the stories that I often hear of the patient who technically has gone against medical advice to go out and be in the trial because maybe they even brought it up to their physician, but their treating physician said they didn't think it was right for them and they went off and screened for the study with an investigator anyway. We have to get beyond that. Uh, the fourth area to me is around the support for patients. and we. We talk increasingly as research sponsors about travel support, but I think it has to go beyond that. It has to start to feel more like the type of concierge support that people need to get from A to B. That might mean childcare. That might mean who's going to look after my dog. There's so many just things in life that get in the way of a patient getting to that study visit. How can we make that easier? The fifth area is around remote and decentralized trials. And again, I want to call out the great work of City that was referenced earlier in this space. Um, inside of our company, we're thinking about this as uh, location flexible trials, as being our goal, as being the high fruit that we're shooting for. Because too often when we think about enabling a trial to be remote or decentralized, we're thinking about simply certain visits in the protocol 
or maybe the whole study has to be virtual versus brick and mortar. But I think our high fruit that we have to shoot for is enabling patients to make that choice on a visit by visit basis because life changes. And in the winter, that patient may be in Florida because they feel better when they're down there in the winter. Or maybe at the holidays, it's just not convenient to leave the house. But the rest of the year, they actually like going to a clinic visit because of the high touch and relationship building that they've had with their coordinators. Protocols shouldn't be deciding that, patients should be so that the study can conform to their life. But for that to work, we need robust endpoints or ones that don't, don't quiver when the wind blows, but endpoints that can actually stand up and be robust for a patient to have that data captured in, point, in place A or B. And the last area I'll call out is in this forward-leaning way that research sponsors talk about deliverables. We talk about the deliverable to regulators. We talk about the deliverable internally that comes out of a study that we use for decision making. And a lot of what I'm hearing this afternoon to me is around the deliverables that go back to the participant. A thank you, the results of the study, your data from the study, your data in context of the results of the study. And whatever those other deliverables may be that patients are defining, just like we define before we start the study, every other type of deliverable. Nobody finishes a study and says, oh, let's submit it to the regulators. They kind of had that planned before they wrote the protocol, along with other deliverables. And we should be thinking the same way about those that are facing the patient. Thanks.